wonderful organization and uh, uh, well this is a joint work with uh, Thomas Komorowski uh, but there are other people that got involved during many years I mean I, I remember I've been talking here in 2006 uh, and I was at the beginning of looking this type of uh, models for conduction of energy uh, don't worry about this title malady this is a European research uh, uh, grant that we have with Liverani and I don't remember what malady means, it's something about macroscopic uh, equation and dynamical system. Um, okay, so... <laughs> yeah, that sounds a bit weird. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, we have seen last Monday, Herbert gave, uh, when gave a talk, this is a, a, a basically the model we will talk about. I mean, th think about the chain of oscillators. Uh, for the moment think about an harmonic but then we will concentrate on the harmonic case uh, where let's say that for the moment the final model will be just the left hand side is attached to some point or think that the theater is a wall so Q0 doesn't move is equal zero <coughs> and then uh, there is some, some force between them that's given by potential V V thinks something nice eventually will be harmonic or FPU type will be some quartic potential and so on but think something uh, technically, something that at, at infinity always grow quadratically because you, at infinity you need some condition like that. And then uh, uh, eventually at the uh, right hand side, if you consider the finite system, uh, just a, a force, here there is a force tau, that can eventually change in time. This is a basically a uh, way to model uh, macroscopically a, a kind of adiabatic thermodynamic transformation changing you have you, you apply certain force tau so you have a certain equilibrium that is established and you change the force tau and it will be eventually arrived to another equilibrium we want to understand how this can happen and uh, of course the deterministic system is too difficult and as we did since many many years is to add some noise that will give uh, the ergodic properties the right ergodic properties to the system and uh, we want that the noise conserve energy and eventually conserve also momentum. There are three conserved quantities that are important here. One is the volume, the elongation, Herbert was talking, was uh, calling it before, which is the sum of this R. Uh, the, the R's are the uh, distance between the particle. Uh, are the R's, the interparticle distance, which are the important thermodynamic quantities which will correspond to the volume of the system, the average of R. And then the momentum and the energy. And you can, uh, uh, you can think very simple noise that conserve uh, the energy and the momentum. One, uh, the most simple is just to take nearest neighbor particles and exchange randomly, uh, wait an exponential time, independently for each couple, and, and exchange their velocity. So you clearly conserve kinetic energy and you conserve energy and uh, you conserve momentum. Or you can do it something more smooth, like exchanging uh, between free particles momentum in such a way you to conserve uh, the total kinetic energy and the total momentum. Basically, for what I will say, these two types of noise will be basically equivalent. So just uh, uh, you will get diff slightly different calculations. So. And uh, uh, we basically you can consider also the system infinite where you will have an infinite dynamics and uh, then there will be uh, no tension like think that like n goes to infinities then you have applied uh, uh, there will be a, a remnant in the equilibrium if you're in equilibrium state there will be re recall of what tension you have applied there that will be parameter in the in the Gibbs measure in the stationary measure that you have uh, that you have there and also here you can add noise, and again, noise of the two types. Uh, now, if you look at the infinite system and you apply, for example, the momentum exchange, this will be enough to make it ergodic. This is a theorem that uh, uh, Joel is involved in, an old theorem of 20 years ago, that uh, if you have a, for such system, if you have a, a translation invariant, a stationary measure with a finite density entropy, and you have the property that uh, uh, the distribution of the velocity, condition to the position, is exchangeable, 
then this is going to be a Gibbs measure. Uh, the uniqueness of the Gibbs measure in the class of entropy, uh, of locally uh, finite entropy, is the right concept of ergodicity for this infinite system. This is the right concept of ergodicity in order to obtain macroscopic law. So the noise is exactly there to make this distribution exchangeable, as the exchange between velocity. It makes it exchangeable, and this will give the right uh, ergodicity to the system. And uh, I insist on the fact, this is true because the system is infinite. If you do it on a finite system, this will not be true. A simple exchange of velocities will not make this, the, the system ergodic in this sense. So I would call this ergodicity of the infinite system. And there are previous results in this direction. So, so this is why you put noise. Once you have put this noise, uh, then you can look at the free conserved quantities. These are the basic conserved quantities that are left in the you system. The invariant measure, then, is that right? Yeah, the invariant measure are given. In fact, the invariant measure here are very nice. They're product measures. Once you look at the R's, are really product measure. Param I didn't write them down, but uh, they are parameterized by the tension, by the velocity, and by the temperature. They correspond to these uh, free conserved quantities, the volume, let's say, or the elongation, like Herbert was saying, uh, the momentum, and the energy. <coughs> and then you can prove that uh, uh, there is a convergence of uh, these uh, uh, quantities to, to this distribution. You have this low large number. Now we have rescaled space and time in an hyperbolic way. So we are looking at the space-time scale in which look at the large time scales, large space scale, rescaled in the same way, and you have convergent to a system of uh, uh, Euler equation. Now, uh, I insist on the fact that x here is the Lagrangian coordinates. So you have to think this system of Euler equation in Lagrangian coordinates. So x is the material coordinates, and then the elongation will be the, int the position of x will be the integral of r from 0 to x. So you have to think it in this way. And uh, OK, this can, you can prove by smooth solution. And uh, this is nothing else than that a version of uh, a very old paper that we proved with Yao and Varan 20 years ago. That was uh, more on a gas. This is just for the discrete case, but with the boundary condition. And you can see the boundary condition here that uh, at, on the left is attached to the wall. And on the right, you feel the tension tau uh, uh, pulling. If you don't pull too fast, uh, you are in the smooth. If you start with the smooth uh, uh, solution, you will have up to a certain time smooth solution for this equation. And this, the, you can prove this theorem as long as you are in the smooth regime of the equation. Yes, John. I mean, just to see, this would be just a standard pressure ensemble. It's a pre yeah, you can call it pressure ensemble. Yes, the pressure ensemble. There are three, but there are three parameters. Equilibrium are three parameters. There's the temperature, there's the momentum, there is the volume. Yeah, I guess in the usual case you have temperature and volume. I guess you don't have. No, okay, momentum because you now you have to consider the system as we, we have taken the macroscopic limit. So you have to consider how uh, the system finds himself after, in a certain point, after I take the macroscopic limit, locally I have a, again an infinite system. Moment is conserved. So Things are moving. Yes, uh, the boundary will be breaking, but locally momentum is conserved. So, <laughs> in fact, uh, that's why uh, you have to compute uh, uh, the parameter tau. This is the tension, the derivative of the entropy with respect to the force. You have to compute an internal energy, and the internal energy you always to take the real energy of that material point, and you have to subtract the kinetic energy of the. Uh, yes? Yes, yeah. the x uh, describe a certain chain. Yes, mm -hmm. and if uh, after you take the limit, at the you have to think that the point x represents an infinite system which has a certain local equilibrium, right. okay. with this, that, with that volume, that or that tension, that uh, energy, and so on. <coughs> and then, uh, uh, then uh, you know, the, this s here is the entropy, the thermodynamic entropy, the one you compute uh, taking the microcanonical volume. Uh, 
taking the logarithm and divided by n. This is a function of, uh, of uh, the volume and the energy. And uh, beta, tau, and u are you can compute it from there. And uh, until, things are, until the evolution is smooth, entropy is conserved. Now, this is conserved really for each point x. This is just due to the fact that uh, we are in Lagrangian coordinates. So there is no irreversibility that comes in until things are smooth. Are the shocks that eventually will appear that will drive the system to the new equilibrium. So I can start with an equilibrium with a certain tension tau. I can start to pull, change the tension to another value. And then I want to see the system that gets to the new equilibrium with the new tension tau. Until the evolution is uh, uh, smooth, of, of course, there is no convergence to equilibrium. will be eventually when uh, shock appears that, uh, that will, will increase the entropy. And this is a problem, the difficult problem, and there's been uh, uh, basically very little or no advance uh, in obtaining hydrodynamic limit uh, when shock appears, at least in system with uh, free conserved quantities. And basically, also because the analysis of this is, uh, is, is uh, happening. But if we believe at this picture, Basically, if this is true, that shock appears, and these are the shocks that drives to equilibrium, basically we are saying that uh, it's in the space time, in the hyperbolic space time, that the system will reach to equilibrium. This is actually not always true. The space, the space time scale could be different. And in fact, there is one example which is different. Let's take, let's take this on the harmonic chain. In the harmonic chain, it will be very bad from the ergodic point of view, but if we put this noise, then it becomes ergodic in this sense, and there will be an evolution given by, uh, for the uh, elongation and the vo velocity, it will be just linear wave equation, and then the energy will be just driven by the gradient of the product of R and P. So it's a linear equation, there will be no shocks. No shock, no entropy dissipation, no convergence to equilibrium, just you see the waves going up and down. So that means, still, we know that the system is ergodic because we have put the noise. That means that the convergence to equilibrium must happen to another space-time scale. <coughs> no, pardon, longer. <coughs> A longer space-time scale. And we want to understand which one is this space-time scale. <coughs> First thing that we understood many years ago already is that... Uh, in this system, energy, uh, yeah, we're talking about the harmonic case, energy is super diffuse in the sense that if you compute the green cubo formula, you see that this green cubo formula diverge. Green cubo formula will give the, <coughs> the, diffuse, the thermal diffusivity of the energy in this, um, in this system, and it's just... Uh, uh, the space-time integral of the current correlation, energy current correlation in equilibrium with temperature beta. And with the noise, you can see, with this noise, you can see that this, com this decays like uh, one of the screw root of t, which is not integrable, so you have a divergence of a green cube of formula. So you have a, a yes? Is the green cube of formula justified? I mean, it's justified to apply it and to believe that it tells me here, no, because in fact it's infinite. When it's infinite, it's not justified. You have something else, that, uh, and that's, that's the point. No, no, but it's justified. Well, let's see, let's see in which sense it's justified. Justified that becomes infinite. I mean, in, in, somehow in this model, we understand exactly what, what happened. Actually, in, uh, if you go in dimension D, you see that from dimension 3 on, it's, it's integrable and this quantity is finite. This corresponds, in fact, to what we expect in, uh, in a three-dimensional uh, unpinned model. And in fact, if the system uh, is uh, pinned, uh, you have also integrability of the... If you, if you destroy the conservation of of momentum, you also have integrability of the green cubo formula. Okay, see, this, this was already understood in 2006. Uh, and uh, then we were trying to understand, okay, there is a super diffusion of energy, but uh, what 
is the nature of this super diffusion. When it's the diffusion, we know this is the Brownian motion. Now this is a super diffusion, what's the process behind? What, the what, what should substitute the heat equation here? Now the fact that the variance is diverging doesn't say much about what is the nature of super diffusion. Because if, the, if it is a, a super diffusion with the infinite variance, if it's not Gaussian in particular, then the variance doesn't say anything about the real space-time scale in which energy evolves. And uh, okay, this is a, a first result. This is actually uh, recent. That in the, in the case where you put destroy the, transla the translation variance, you put some pinning, then you s what you require the right quantity to look is the uh, space-time correlation of the energy. And this uh, properly rescaled, <coughs> if you see if you rescale like, uh, like, heat like the solution of heat equation, you have uh, uh, diffusion. Uh, this actually, we expect this also, in the, this we, ex we prove this in dimension three or if the system is pin, if you put a pin in potential. In dimension two, uh, you still have diffusive behavior, but you have just to rescale slightly the time by logarithm of t. It's super diffuse, but it's, it's basically a diffusive behavior. That's the usual uh, thing. But uh, in uh, one dimension, what we expect uh, and what uh, we actually prove is the, uh, a Levy type super diffusion. That means a convergence in a time scale order epsilon to the minus three half, where epsilon is in the particle distance, typically in the particle distance, to a super diffusion. So the function f should behave like like a uh, solution of the fractional heat equation with parameter 3, 4. So of course, this is an infinite variance process. So again, you have to study this uh, space-time correlation and not just the variance of the in Kubo. Hmm? Can I ask? Please. So this is for what? <coughs> this is still oscillators on a lattice? This is harmonic oscillators. Harmonic with this noise that conserve energy and momentum. Yes. And two dimensions in the arc. One dimension. No, no, but the previous results. Ah, the dimension. previous results were in every, in every, I mean, dimension, it uh, could be dimension three. And again for harmonic oscillators. Harmonic oscillators. <coughs> yeah. Right. I mean, if you don't put uh, noise, in dimension three will be infinite always because it's ballistic, but the fact that it's dimension three. And in one dimension, I mean, this is actually, uh, what we, I, I would like to explain how to, uh, what, uh, pre how precisely we, we prove this super diffusion in terms of the convergence of the Wigner distribution. This is the unpin case, right? This is the unpin case. The pin case is, uh, it, is included in this previous case and it's just perfectly diffusive. Oh, where, where is it? Here. This is pin case or pin system. Yeah, this the or, or, or pin, or, or pin. Or, or is dimensions bigger than three or pin? Okay, the, all, the, all these cases, these things are diffuse. Okay, um, uh, this, I mean, uh, that somehow there wa was a, a, a Levy super diffusion. Uh, heuristically, I mean, uh, I didn't know until some time ago, but at least there, there, wa there was a suggestion that this could be the case because there was, uh, uh, I'm sorry, this is, uh, no, sorry, this is a relation somehow. Why, why this is uh, relevant? Well, because somehow, uh, that that was somehow the, the, the what pushed this year to 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 perform all this calculation and this result. Uh, the, there was a preprint by Herbert who says that uh, if you look at the, uh, for example, at the beta f Fermi Pasteur and the an anharmonic case, and you look at the heat mode, then this heat mode should actually super diffuse the conjecture passing through uh, fluctuating hydrodynamics and mode coupling type of calculation. This heat mode should actually super diffuse following a Levy uh, process with this exactly the same parameter free half as we find in our in this system. Uh, this is the uh, beta uh, means that uh, the potential beta at zero tem at zero tension that means that somehow the interaction is symmetric. And the symmetry is uh, is uh, important in this. I mean, I, I hope Herbert will have. Okay, just <laughs> give more explanation about this. While for the alpha FPU, we are talking always about the heat mode, 
is expected another uh, Levy process, but with a different parameter, so a, a bigger spreading of the, of the heat mode. No, eta is the uh, macroscopic, uh, is the Fourier, Fourier variable. Yeah, okay, if you want to. It's not the momentum, <laughs> it's the, the Fourier transform. So, the eta, eta is the so that means it's the lab, uh, solution of, lab, of uh, fractional uh, Laplacian with this parameter. There. Okay, and uh, uh, so let's, let's see how this is. Uh, uh, how, how one can uh, prove such thing, and actually what, what a, a precise statement. Uh, now I go back, uh, I prefer to do the calculation with the variables Q. Q are now the position of the particles, and the R, they were the just the gradient. So this is just the uh, equation, it looks very simple, but there is, uh, uh, this is the case uh, where we put uh, a smoothing a smooth exchange of velocity between the particles, free particles. We could have done the calculation also for the exchange, the discrete exchange between momentum of nearest neighbor, but this is just for the... So this means that uh, the Q and P at time t, just solution of this system <coughs> of uh, uh, stochastic differential equation. With the generator, there is just the noise acting on the velocity. This is a Stratonovich uh, uh, integral, um, the Stratonovich product between this uh, W, X, K, K are independent uh, Wiener processes, and Y, X are tangent uh, vector to the uh, sphere. Well, now we you fix the kinetic energy, you fix the, the momentum, so you still have a circle. So this is the tangent vector to this circle. So you have to have... Uh, you want to keep these two conserved quantities there. Uh, I don't like to work on the Stratonovich integral, but it's nice to write things short. Um, let's uh, let's uh, generalize a little bit, in fact, the calculation, and let's put not only nearest neighbor uh, interaction springs, but uh, let's put uh, more general springs between, uh, between the atoms. So there will be some function alpha uh, of compact support or, uh, or uh, of um, exp with exponential decay, you have to assume that the Fourier transform is strictly positive. And uh, we don't have a chain on the uh, And uh, uh, unpinned means that the alpha, the Fourier transform of the coupling alpha in zero is equal to zero. And what's very important is that is an acoustic chain. Acoustic chain means uh, second derivative of alpha. Uh, hat in zero, strictly positive. Uh, this, this implies that the, the dispersion relation, which is the square root of uh, alpha hat, uh, will, be, uh, will have a, a derivative that basically is independent of the mode k. Uh, omega prime k is basically the velocity of the phonon of uh, mode k. That means the velocity of the phonon depends very little of the mode k. This is what actually brings the mechanism of uh, the um, superdiffusion. Basic mechanism is low modes scatter very little, but the velocity of the low modes keep going. So low modes keep moving ballistically for a very long time until it gets to an higher mode for scattering. Does some diffusion and then scatters again. This is the the basic mechanism of the, of the superdiffusion. That makes this uh, integral for small k infinite. This will be, this is the, f uh, is the, is the, fact, is the, the basic fact that uh, the um, diffusivity is infinite. Uh, the nearest neighbor k is just the two times sine of pi k. So this is the, the equation. Uh, it's nice to work in uh, Fourier transform and uh, to work with the wave function that you just uh, uh, obtain, uh, taking Fourier transform of the P and the Q, and you combine them in a complex way. You multiply Q by omega K and uh, P hat by I. You obtain uh, a wave function C hat TK, uh, which satisfy this 
stochastic differential equation. It's the, sa it's the same equation as before, just in Fourier variable k. Okay. So the, f the, f the free motion is just uh, the multiplication by i minus i omega k, so everybody's familiar with this part. Uh, then there is the effect of the, of the noise, of the exchange of velocities, which is uh, now, now we have a real integral of eta, so there is a drift term with a, a function beta k, beta hat k. Uh, if you think that beta hat k goes for small k like k squared, it's related to the Laplacian because there is an exchange of, uh, of uh, velocities. And, uh, and then this is the Martingale part. This dw omega k is just a complex uh, uh, white noise. So that means it's uh, delta correlated in k and in time. And uh, if you take the star, and if you don't take the star, the expectation is just zero. So it's the uh, uh, complex white, complex valid white noise. And so you have this stochastic integral. And the important thing is this. Uh, uh, scattering rate R k k prime, which have this form. It does, doesn't matter the real form. I mean, there is uh, just this functional one, which is the sine of pi k, and the beta k is that's to this form here. So it goes like k. Squ the, the important thing is here. This goes like k square, and then uh, this uh, function R. So this is just the calculation of the of the equation in Fourier transform. What uh, you don't like? So the noise in x space is totally spread out. Yes, it's because it's very local in uh, in uh, it's ve very local noise in uh, in the x space. Yeah. Of course, in k space uh, you have. Uh, but in k space, it's very local. It's well. Uh, no, 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 no. In x in, in the original space is completely local. Ah, no, but this is just, uh, but there's an integral also, against, the, uh, ag just an integral against uh, a kernel. So, you, so from one, from, if, you, if, 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 you can, you can, you can go from one k to any other k with a certain probability. I mean, there's not really, there's not really a process here. You will see, you will see now. Um, okay, so this is the evolution for the wave function. It's nice to work. And then uh, uh, the we want to somehow localize the energy. And uh, one way to localize is to use Wigner distribution that basically you take psi star psi computing k minus epsilon eta, k plus epsilon eta. So now it's in very important this variable eta. This is the slow. Fourier variable that take into account the macroscopic coordinate, while k is going to be a fast Fourier variable. It's important to distinguish between the slow and the fast Fourier variable. And, and uh, the usual Wigner distribution is just the Fourier transform <coughs> in the slow variable eta of this, uh, of this function here. In the limit, we'll see what, uh, what, 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 what does it give. So this is, of course, always in a, in a torus, in, in, a, in a circle. So k, k will be valid in a circle. We started from a discrete lattice. So now uh, let's start. It's not an equilibrium result. This is a result that basically say we start with the initial condition, uh, initial uh, packet of energy localized somewhere. So uh, uh, a wave function, this should be psi at time zero as L2 norm bounded by epsilon minus one. Grows, energy grows like epsilon minus one now in the scaling. So it will be macroscopically, but uh, confined. So no, non-equilibrium. Equilibrium will have to start with infinite energy. And then uh, uh, you assume that uh, at time zero, the Wigner distribution will convert, when you integrate in the fast variable, it converts to some W0 eta, so some distribution in the slow variable eta which will correspond, the Fourier transform will give an energy distribution in the macroscopic scale. So you start with a certain energy distribution, then you want to see how this energy distribution evolves in a large time scale. And this is a theorem. Well, you look at the <coughs> Wigner distribution. 
there is uh, the fast variable, k, the slow variable eta, and you look at time epsilon minus 3LT. And this converge as epsilon goes to zero to the initial distribution multiplied by e to the hex c t, eta to the three alpha. That means this is going to be a solution of the fractional eta equation, the Fourier transform of the solution of the fractional eta equation with that parameter. Eta will be the variable. Eta. Notice that this is the limit for every k. k is going to be averaged out because we are looking at a large time scale. So k is the fast variable. So this is for any k, it's a kind of uh, local equilibrium in, uh, in, uh, in the moment space. Just we have this convergence to something that does not depend on k and evolves in, in t and depends on eta in this way. <coughs> you can, of course, compute also the parameter c hat that is there. Uh, you see how important is the uh, condition that the second derivative of alpha zero is positive, which is the, uh, let's say the chain, uh, uh, acoustic chain condition, the acoustic chain condition. Uh, the parameter gamma <coughs> is the strength of the noise. Of course, this parameter will diverge. If the noise goes to zero, uh, you are back to the harmonic chain where uh, we have no, do not have any nice uh, macroscopic, macroscopic behavior, so everything has to explode when, uh, when the level of the noise goes to zero. How to prove this? Well, it's, uh, it's a calculation, long, but I'm trying to, uh, well, before, uh, I'll try to <coughs> give an idea how to do this, how to do this calculation, how to simplify, at least we will simplify enormously here to give an idea how to make it converge. There was a previous uh, work by, with the, uh, with uh, Giada Basile and Herbert, where we look at the system, but we take a rarify, is a, we take a kinetic limit in the sense that we rescale the noise. We make the noise very slow. So in the macroscopic time scale, there is a finite number of collisions, exactly like in a Boltzmann limit. In this uh, uh, limit, then you have that the Wigner function converge, k, k is not anymore uh, fast because you have only a finite number of scattering per unit time. So you converge to um, a Boltzmann equation of this type. Uh, there is the uh, TW. There is a transport term. Uh, this should be eta, sorry, not P. Uh, this, one. this should be e I eta omega k. That means there is the in the original space there is the gradient. Omega prime k is the velocity. So this, and then there is some scattering uh, operator L where L here is really a generator of a Markov process on the circle of momentum. And uh, uh, so in, the, in this limit, you can really think that what the limit is, you get a phonon of, or, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, mode k that moves with velocity omega prime k and then scatters, scatters with a rate which is given by rkk prime. That means uh, at the rate rkk prime, get the new mode, uh, the new mode of, uh, which is k prime. And uh, one of the important thing here, and I will, uh, for the calculation that, that uh, we'll do later, is that this rate, which is related to the microscopic rate by this relation here, is actually sum of product of function of k and k prime. We see that when uh, just a product of function k and k prime will be very simple. On the other hand, it's clear why it's very simple when it's just a product of function k, k prime. That means that uh, uh, if you look at uh, the process will be just changing from k to k prime at a speed, uh, at a rate rk, and then it's uh, basically an independent Markov chain where it gets a new value with, uh, with the rate k prime, with probability k prime. So product structure clearly helps. But uh, it's not a product structure, but it's a sum of product structure. That's, uh, that's a relatively useful thing. And then uh, uh, once you have such Markov process, moving with relative omega prime k, you can prove an invariance principle. You have a process, you just prove an invariance principle, scale, space, and time. As a probabilist, we did uh, the work to prove that this converge, uh, this if you took a disposition, this converge to a a stable uh, Levy process with parameter free half. So corresponding to this, that fractional Laplacian. So this was basically a limit done in two steps. 
first we do the kinetic limit, and after we do the rescaling in space and time of the kinetic limit to obtain. And we wanted to understand, is it true if we, do, we, do, if we don't pass through the, the kinetic equation, we don't pass through the Boltzmann equation, we want to do a direct hydrodynamic limit, a direct space-time scaling without touching the dynamics, without making any rescaling of noise of the dynamics. And uh, uh, that somehow, uh, the way we prove this is really using probability. We have a process that k is a kernel. Uh, then there was a, a, a Stefan, uh, Stefan Michel, a Clement Mouault and Melet that were working actually in, uh, uh, at, at, at uh, more or less at the same time on a proof on, a, on something like this was a different kind of Boltzmann equation. And they were uh, uh, doing a completely analytical approach to this. And for me, we say, well, but this is a, mar a nice Markov process. You, uh, you have invariance principle, and you, you have theorem that for convergence to, to Levy process. And somehow, uh, at that time, I said, well, it's much, so much easier to use probability why do you want to use uh, analysis for such problems. In fact, uh, a posteriori, I find that this analytical method is actually quite useful because in probability, when you don't have something positive, or if it's not a generator of a Markov process, then you are completely, you are completely lost. You lose all intuition. Analysis can go beyond. But on the other end, I lose intuition in the other <coughs> way. So this has uh, been man, rediscovered, this work of them, and that was inspiration how to solve the direct limit, where in the direct limit we don't have the Markov process already there. And uh, I should mention also that uh, recently Milton uh, Jara as another approach to obtain such limit, but for a two concept for the moment for the moment for the two concept quantity, and it's completely based on uh, on PD, not uh, not uh, using Fourier transform. I don't know exactly how what the um, exact statement is. I mean, I I, I know <laughs> the type of calculation, but I don't know exactly what the statement is. Okay, uh, how how to prove this? How to prove this convergence of this Wigner distribution? Well, first you introduce, uh, sim uh, the, the thing seems simpler. I mean, uh, I know people here have worked on uh, uh, Wigner distribution on, on more complex system, and you say, well, this is a basically, it's not linear, it's almost linear. Well, it's a, actually the microscopic system has a multiplicative type of noise. It's not an additive noise. If you remember, it was a multiplicative noise, so it's really the, that's the source of nonlinearity. But also we are looking at the function, which is, en which is the energy, which is a nonlinear function of the, of the system. So this uh, gives some complication. Let's say it's simpler than other similar work on, uh, on Wigner distribution. So you need uh, to introduce the anti-Wigner distribution. Let's call it zeta, e zeta epsilon. It's defined like, like, like the Wigner distribution, but there's, there's no psi star, there's psi psi. If the Wigner distribution represents the, des the density of the energy, the anti-Wigner represents the difference of the kinetic energy and the potential energy. Energy is conserved, so it's something that evolves slowly and we can see it macroscopically. But the difference between kinetic energy and potential energy is something that fluctuates fast. And uh, because of fast fluctuation, this term, at least when time integrated, should disappear from your equation. You need this, uh, this quantity to close the equation. Basically, you write down the time, you compute the time derivative of the Wigner distribution, and you get involved uh, with uh, uh, this already expanded in, uh, in uh, small epsilon. You get various terms. You get a transport term, which function of this eta here. You remember, eta is a, mac is a Fourier, macroscopic Fourier variable. There is a scattering term, so the first line looks very much like the Boltzmann equation you wrote before. But then there is a price. The price is uh, the, the generator L of that scattering applied to this zeta. And then there, are, uh, there is, again, another operator L tilde, which I don't want to write here. And because this, is this term here is related to the uh, diffusive scaling. If things were diffusive, you see, that means uh, uh, this is time delta. If delta is equal to this term will be important. In fact, there is an eta square here, which is the Laplacian. But in fact, now in the time scale we want to take, which is delta equal to third, this term with, uh, that uh, corresponds to the Laplacian will disappear because there will be further 
we are looking at the time scale which is before the diffusive time scale. And then other temperature over the epsilon. I don't write you down. There is, for zeta, for the anti weak distribution, you have a similar evolution. Then you have this uh, more or less, you can see, complicated. It's uh, actually, if you want to see it as a linear, looks linear. It's not really linear because it's, there is some antilinearity here. Here you see there is zeta, epsilon, eta, this is minus eta, and so on. If you want to write it as a linear uh, system, you have actually to write four equations. And uh, and then you have uh, linear equations. Now, let me cut off like 20, 30 pages of calculations. But <laughs> 20 pages, let's say. But, le but making two assumptions which are reasonable, that you can, you can believe it. Uh, you are looking at large time scale. Because you're looking at large time scale, the k is the scattering, it's start to scatter continuously. So it averages out. So whatever limit you get for this Wigner distribution, uh, you get something that is independent of k. So you get a function uh, that, uh, here, a function that does not depend on k. And uh, for the zeta, as, as this is what I said before, is just a difference of kinetic and the potential energy, something that fluctuates fast, and this goes to zero. So let me drop from the equation zeta hat because you will integrate out in time, because basically you can show that it goes to zero. And uh, in the calculation, we'll assume that the limit will not depend on k. Because to prove it rigorously, this you need some, some, some time, but it's, uh, it's quite reasonable. I mean, these are the, pa the intuitive part. The rest uh, is a calculation. It's a an kind of analytic proof that, that doesn't use the probability anymore, the intu intuition of a convergent or a Markov process to a Levy process, just the analytical proof, which is the part where I lose intuition. It's just the analysis that drives you to the conclusion. So we drop zeta and the smaller term in epsilon. So we are left basically with the very similar, with the, with the uh, uh, equation we studied before, but we have uh, this scaling here, the epsilon minus 2d and the epsilon d plus 1. And this is the, sca and this is the uh, scattering term uh, L epsilon. This is the scattering operator with the R. So now let me simplify further the problem. Let me assume that the, the scattering rate, k, k prime, is said to be a sum of product of a function of k and k prime. It's just the function of k and k prime. Then the, 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 for the sum, you just complicate the algebra. But uh, let's assume that this is a product. So let's assume that this is a product and the integral over k is equal 1. And the k goes like k squared. So that means that uh, uh, the scattering operator will just be of the form uh, rk. This is bracket is the integral of r with w hat minus rkw. So we'll have this simple, simple form here. That's what we will use in the calculation. Now, uh, a linear equation, let me use all the linear tools. So let's take Laplace transform in time. And uh, remember I denote with the bracket rw bar the integral of r and w. This is with the, with the Laplace transform. This uh, W hat is the Laplace transform of the, of the Wigner distribution. And you have a solution of this, this will be a solution of this equation here. Uh, just a simple direct calculation. And then you rearrange it, and you have that W epsilon eta k lambda. You put all together the w together just to get a ratio between these two factors here. And here k appears in front. There is uh, still uh, an equation. No, this is not really good. This is really w epsilon appears here and, ap and appears inside this integral here. Then uh, I multiply by rk. This is a stupid trick, but it's what makes it work. Because it, I'm, multi I'm multiplying by rk and integrating in k. And this is a kind of a transparent operation because I know that in the limit as epsilon goes to zero, uh, k, this quantity will not depend on k. So basically, if I multiply here by r and integrate in k, it's a, it's a transparent operation in the limit. But this permits to 
obtain uh, a closed equation of in, uh, in this integral. And just get uh, this integral, there, there are just these two terms here. You just rearrange it. You pull, you pull this term then on the left because you have the same thing here. And, and this is what's left to the right. And remember, there is already the eta there. Th is some fractional power of eta has to appear uh, at, at the end. Uh, you rearrange it in this. So this is the same equation that I wrote before. And then you have just to prove that the first, this, this term here, this is uh, at the right-hand side, uh, it's easy to see that this goes to 0, this goes to 0, rk divided by rk. So this converges to the initial condition, w0. The other term, the important term, the, fra the fractional power, comes from here. And this is, comes out just using the fact that rk goes like a square. It's just uh, an exercise, little uh, computation. The, the fact that omega prime k is acoustic, so it goes basically is constant in k. And for small k, so this is constant. For small k, this like, uh, goes like a square. Just do the calculation. You see that you converge to lambda plus uh, c hat eta to the free alpha. That's where, where the eta to the free alpha appears. That's where the fractional Laplacian appears. It's not very intuitive, I agree. <laughs> Just the calculation, and I would like to, to have a better, if wh when you do this uh, uh, using probability, you have a better understanding than this. And, uh, and then you have that, uh, what you have on the left, uh, since you know that w converges to a constant in k, and the integral over k uh, converges to, integral over k, over k in the k is equal to 1, this converges to some function w eta lambda which is the limit. That uh, gives you the, uh, heat the Laplace Fourier transform of the fractional heat equation, which concludes the proof. Now, to do this for, uh, uh, for uh, the actual uh, uh, rate, sc scattering rate, is a bit more complicated. But basically, the argument goes in this way. And uh, then there are the two, these two things that have to be proven, but intuitively it's clear. That that, that's, and that's how, how this fractional equation appears out from a direct limit. And we hope that this idea maybe works in other cases in which you have uh, equations that are, can be homogenized, but are not necessarily, uh, where the scattering part is not necessarily a generator of a Markov process can go out of the probabilitistic picture. Well, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much.